Hey everyone, welcome back to the arena. I'm MD joined here by Kobe and once again, another special guest that we can't wait to open up a conversation with. Uh, first conversation of the new year. Happy new year to our listeners here in 2024. And uh, yeah, I'll kick it over to you. Yes, uh, surely not the first release of the new year, but our first conversation of the year, we've had a little bit of a hiatus between uh, holiday stuff traveling, but super glad to be back with the microphone and in this chair. Um, we have a very special guest on today. His name is Peter Levine, Dr. Peter Levine. He is the renowned developer, uh, emphasis on renowned, of somatic experiencing. He holds a doctorate in medical and biological physics from the University of California at Berkeley, as well as a doctorate in psychology from International University. Uh, he is the recipient of four Lifetime Achievement Awards and the author of several books, including Waking the Tiger, which has been printed in over 30 countries and sold over a million copies. And he is also coming out with a new book in April, an autobiography of autobiography of trauma. So uh, with that long, um, but very impressive introduction, right. I will kick it over to Peter to kind of just share. Peter, why don't you just share who is Peter Levine and kind of how you got to where you are today? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, that is a long story story. But let me t actually maybe just kind of take off from what you were saying, Matt, about your journey of self-healing and coming to the other side and in that journey, becoming more empathetic and open to others. And, you know, my experience in working with trauma now for 50 years is when we heal our own wounds, we are much more available for others to support them in, in, in coming to, to contact with their wounds and healing their wounds. So, um, and what I'm going to say to you is that I can very much identify this in a particular way. You mentioned that I have a book, uh, which is actually available now uh, on Amazon. It's called An Autobiography of Trauma. A healing journey. It's my healing journey, but a healing journey. And, you know, uh, oh gosh, about three years ago, I, you know, was really coming to grips with my process of my age development because I clearly have less years to live forward than I have years looking backward. And so I really wanted to kind of come to be able to engage my own journey so that I could put together some um, some guidance for other people and to support them in their in their healing and um, so anyhow initially it was just for me to excavate excavate my own traumas my own issues my own pitfalls, my own healing, uh, and it was just for me. And I had no intention of uh, putting it out as a, as a book. But uh, a very close friend of mine, and then another person who was a publisher, uh, somehow asked to see the manuscript. And they said, you know, I think you really should make a book out of it. And I said, no way, it's too vulnerable. It's in some places too raw. There's no way that I, that's also something has, has to do with, you know, knowing that, yeah, this is an aging process. And although I have a lot of health, a lot of vibrant, vi vi vivacity, and people say that they are really surprised to know what age I am, I am not going to divulge that. Um, so, okay. So anyhow, uh, really having a conflict. At one, at, on one side, this is, was just for me. I don't want to, uh, I didn't want to put it out in the public eye at all. And then the prodding from my, my friends and the publisher to make a book. And that was two years ago. And so, and I went, I went on that task, except I couldn't really commit to doing it. It just somehow, I, I was resistant. I thought it would maybe be too much for some people. 
uh, and I wouldn't do it unless I was really sure that it could help in other people's healings. So, uh, so anyhow, in my confusion or my ambivalence, I had the following dream. And when I'm in a situation where something is important and I really don't know what my next step is, I will often have a dream. And I and dreams have been very kind to me and not always easy, but have always been kind to me in that it's kind of sets uh, uh, my path forward. And so the dream that I had was that I was standing facing a large field. And in my hands, uh, I had a whole bunch of pages that were with typewritten on them. And I looked to the left, I looked to the right, I looked to the left. And again, I, I didn't know what my next step would be. But then while I was uh, trying to figure this out, a strong breeze came from behind me and took all of the papers and brought them into the air and they landed in this meadow to land where they would land. And then it became clear to me that, yes, I would do this. It wasn't easy all for, for sure, not all at once. It wasn't easy. And I, uh, uh, but I realized that, um, that this would be a gift that I can give, not just to myself, a, a, not an easy gift, but a gift, but something that I could leave as part of my, I guess you could say my legacy for the people who are, as you are describing, Matt, your journey of self-healing, that this can help catalyze some of that. So that's how that, that began. So now we can go backwards to uh, when I started discovering, and this was in the late 1960s and into the early 70s, that, um, and this was, again, this was 12 years, 13 years before the definition of trauma as PTSD. So I didn't know, fortunately, that trauma was supposed to be a, a, a brain disorder, a brain disease even, that could only be managed by, by medications and also helping people change their negative thoughts. And so I discovered something quite, quite different. What I was doing is uh, I had, was developing some mind-body approaches, working with certain muscles, particularly in the jaw, the neck, the shoulders, with a group of men who had high blood pressure. And as I found this particular sequence, sometimes the blood pressure will drop 10 points, 20 points, even 30, uh, and occasionally 40 points. And it seemed to be lasting. I mean, with some, I continue to do some of this, but it, it seemed to be lasting. But then as I worked with those people, I discovered something else, that many of those people had something which we would now call trauma, times when they were just terrified, where they were overwhelmed, where, where they were feeling absolutely helpless. And I noticed that this was something, of course, that involves the brain and, and the mind, but primarily it's something that occurs in the body. So, for example, if you walk out your door and you see somebody uh, on a bicycle being hit by a car and your guts go, ugh, and then you look even more and then you see this person's really, really been injured and it goes, yeah, oh my God. So you gut wrenches and there's a nerve in the back of the brainstem that goes down below the diaphragm and to all of our organs, especially the gastrointestinal system below the diaphragm, but also to our heart and our lungs. Actually, Darwin studied this nerve and he called it the pneumogastric nerve, lung, uh, uh, gastrointestine. And so what would happen, well, First of all, what Darwin realized and what many people don't realize is that nerve, the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, is the largest nerve in the body. As I said, it goes from the back of the brainstem down below the diaphragm and to all of our subdiaphragmatic organs and to our lungs and, and our heart. 
And, um, but what happens in this example that I'm giving, where you see the person really be injured, so your guts twist, but this nerve is 80% afferent. That means it's 80% sensory. So it's actually taking information from the guts and relaying that information back up to the brain where it gets amplified. Because again, most of those nerve fibers are actually taking information from our organs and giving that information back to the brain where it becomes amplified. So instead of just yuck, it's like, ugh. And then later that evening, you're laying down in bed and all of a sudden you see the image of the person who was injured. And again, your guts twist and your heart maybe beats and you have difficulty in taking a breath. So the question is, how can you interrupt this cycle? I call it a positive feedback loop with negative consequences. So each time it goes up from the brain to the body, the body back up to the brain, it becomes more, it becomes amplified further and further. Also, and in our society, and, and I think this is one of the, the side effects of healing trauma, particularly working from, a, from the vantage point of body awareness, is that the mind and the body are not separated. Even, for example, what we call psychosomatic, the idea there is that our mind is our psyche, our mind is influencing our body, but it's not, that's not, that's not correct. It's not accurate. It's just that they're in communication. And again, Darwin called this nerve, the pneumogastric nerve, and he realized that it was responsible for gut wrench and heartbreak. And that said it right there. So how do you help people move out of gut wrench and out of states of, uh, of, of despair and come back in, into life. So that was really where my journey, my therapeutic uh, journey started in finding out how I could train people to do what I was doing. And, uh, and, and then, because now I, I think you mentioned something about this, you know, the work is now taught in, I think in about 44 different countries to, I think about 50 or 60,000 um, practitioners. And so when I was developing the work, it felt like a burden, you know, cause I knew there was something there, but I didn't quite know how to get it out in the world. So it really weighed on my shoulders. And now that, that weight is shared by 50 uh, trainers that I and other trainers have trained and that work in these 44 different countries. And, and so I'm unburdened from that. So when I asked myself the question, have I done enough? I can answer that in the affirmative. Yes, I have done enough. The other question is, am I enough? And that's the question that's a work in progress. And that's what led me to writing the autobiography and, um, and coming to this understanding of my path and how it, how I lived through it, how I survived some things that you might think were difficult, quite difficult to survive. And then coming out on the other side of this and finding more peace, more joy, more empathy for myself and also for others, and as you described, Matt. So that's my journey. That's a little bit of the theory behind it. And um, uh, what would you like me to talk about next? Well, you, you caught me, you caught my, uh, I'm interested in something you said at the end, which is the question that we ask ourselves often, am I enough? And does that question, ever go away? Is there ever a point of um, like actualization where we, we never ask ourselves, am I enough? Because I, for me personally, I've gotten to the point wow. in my life where that question yeah. is asked a lot less. I ask myself that question a lot less than <laughs> I used to, yeah, yeah, but yeah. there are points in time where I still question myself, yeah. like, am I really enough? And so I'm just curious yeah. for your perspective. Wow. Well, that, thank you. Um, that really touched me. Um, 
You know, uh, the idea in, in, in doing this autobiography was to go on a more of self-discovery of the am I enough part. And the question, does it ever go away? I think less and less, just, just what you said. I mean, sometimes it comes and goes, but overall, I do feel like I am enough. And I feel deeply supported by colleagues and friends. And that's part of because some of my life was about isolation because uh, being seen by other people could have result, resulted in, uh, in, in life threat. Um, the, the mafia was after my family for many years, long story there. And my life was in jeopardy. So to, to even write something or to say something about that seemed too much. So that kind of took me away from the am I enough. But now I, I think I can honestly say, Matt, that more and more I am enough. And I have times when I, I kind of lose my ground, lose my traction. But I come back because it's familiar to me now. I, I know where to go, where to look. And so um, I am enough. And some residue of this, some echoes of that will probably be there. I don't know what's it's one of the things I've also been looking at. What is it like to die? What is it like to leave this world? And when I do that, will I have felt that I am enough, that I have met my, my destiny? So I think I share with you this uh, uh, understanding that, yeah, it gets less and less. Uh, we become more and more uh, of enoughness uh, in ourselves, uh, but it's always going to be there in some way, even if it's a small way. And then if something happens where I'm really challenged and I realize, wait a minute, I'm not... I, I, I'm being reactive. I'm really not present in myself. And then when I get become present in myself, then I know again, I am enough. And on the topic of being enough, you know, I, I would imagine that's something that I wouldn't know, but a therapist would maybe affirm of their clients or like something that would be a good positive self affirmation of, you know, looking yourself in the mirror and reaffirming that you are enough. I'm just curious, like, mm -hmm. is there a mind body connection to that of being enough? Is there a sense of when you don't feel that you're enough, ah. what is your body going through versus ah. when you do feel you Absolutely. are? Absolutely. Yep. 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 You know, we were very much misled by Mr. Descartes, Rene Descartes, who said that the mind and the body were separate and never the, near the twain should meet. And I think one of the things as a society and in commerce and in business and in, in life, uh, we continue with this disconnection. And as we connect to our bodies, uh, again, using the example of the vagus nerve, then we feel together, we feel unity, unity of mind and body. And, and when I feel unity of my mind and my body, then I know that I am enough. Hmm. Then I am enough. I echo that. Sorry, I, I keep going. But yeah, I, I am sitting here like I, I could not agree more. But keep I don't going. know if I followed it. Can you bring that to life for me a bit? Uh, well, for me, it's just like I think about myself during med med meditation as a form to really get in touch with my mind and my body. And when I'm sitting there and deeply connected with myself, I, I feel, I mean, walking through life now, I feel enough, but I really get that feeling of just connected with my heart um, and everything I can feel. Mm. Like I feel all the sensations in my feet and my hands, like I'm totally present with myself, like everything's connected. And so in those moments, I, I absolutely feel enough. But that, that was just something coming through my head as, as you were speaking. Yeah. Well, those are the moments, sorry, those are the moments to treasure. You know, Descartes, as I say, he basically uh, said, nope, they're not together. They're just two different things. And uh, Pascal, uh, I forget his last, first name. Uh, uh, anyhow, oh, Blaise, Blaise Pascal. He, he wrote a letter to Descartes, they were about the same time, and he basically said, 
you have totally screwed it up, Monsieur Descartes. This is absolutely wrong, and you're going to lead people in the wrong direction. And then uh, uh, Pascal, he wrote, the heart has its reason, which reason cannot reason. Or said another way, the body has its reason, which reason cannot reason. And I think that we've become so enamored with reasoning and, and reasoning is important. I mean, of course it's important, but if it's the whole story and it takes precedence, like you have the, the master and its emissary, uh, we need to find a way to connect with our hearts and with our guts. And, um, and I think that's the side effect of working in somatic experiencing is that healing occurs when healing occurs or as healing occurs, there is that sense of unity between mind and body, between body and mind, between heart and mind, between heart and soul and mind. So I think really at this point, you know, and here we are in what, 19, uh, uh, 2024, and as I kind of look around, it seems to me that there's coming to a bifurcation point, a point now where people are becoming attracted to situations or to therapies or to meditation or yoga or whatever that all help to bridge mind and and body and i think that uh, i mean you never know you know this might be long after i've passed out of this world but i do have the sense that it is happening and well and just the fact that we're sitting together and talking about this stuff matt um i think is just an indication that exactly that is happening you were to say something i was gonna go dive oh into somewhere else yeah um, i'm gonna ask well can you go ahead go ahead Sure. No, you got it. Dr. Peter. Um, I would love to dive a little deeper back into um, some of the origination of your work, um, mostly just about you and like what inspired your interest in um, wanting to learn about the potential mind body connection that you ended up learning and proving for yourself right. and what was going on in your life? Did you see somebody get hit off of a bicycle or what was going oh, on in your life that oh, inspired no. Many things happened. Um, my life, our life was threatened and I experienced uh, violence, uh, from, uh, uh, the, uh, the mafia. And this went on for a period of t at least 12 years. And, you know, in Greek mythology, one of the archetypes is the archetype of, uh, of Chiron and Chiron I think we now, some people have really uh, pointed out that, that Chiron really is about the wounded healer. And we have to heal our own wounds if we're going to facilitate other, our, other people's wounds. And so uh, I was having all of these very difficult symptoms, which eventually let me let me come in a, in a healing way to what was rape. And, um, but it, I took it very slowly. And when I started having these different symptoms, which were troubling me, I asked one of my students or we're, we're now, um, we're now, uh, uh, teachers to sit with me and to guide me towards these symptoms. And she did that. And that's where I was able to come. One of the things in somatic experiencing is we don't go directly into the trauma. So one of the, the ways that I, I uh, uh, started my, the start of the book, started my journey is going to a time in my life when I felt really nourished, supported, loved, cared for. And this was, I think it was probably around my fourth birthday. And um, I was sleeping in, in my bed and in the middle of the night, or I guess in the early in the morning, my parents snuck in and they laid tracks under my bed, out into the room, around in the room, and then back under the bed again. So it was like an oval. 
And so I woke up to the sound of the train going around the tracks and I jumped out of joy. I, I, I jumped in joy. I just was, I rushed over to the transformer. I controlled the speed. I made the horn go, woo, woo. I felt cared for. I felt loved. And this feeling in my body was a platform that helped me deal with the violence and the rape and the danger that our family experienced. So we don't, in somatic experiencing, we don't go right into the trauma. We go really into what I call the counter vortex or a healing vortex is a time when our body felt fully alive and connecting. So, um, so anyhow, uh, that tells you a little bit about the method and, and why for me, whoops, I think I lost you there. Okay. Um, the method and, and, and pitfalls, you know, uh, I think many different therapies are helpful. The one therapy that I don't really, uh, cotton to are therapies where they have the client relive their traumas over and over and over the idea of dra uh, draining the swamp. And I think that can be an, an illusion. And uh, because we don't drain the, we have to have new experiences in our bodies that contradict those of fear, terror, over and overwhelming helplessness, rage and overwhelming helplessness. We have to have new experiences. We don't have to keep going over the traumas over and over again, but we have to find a way to create new experiences in our bodies that, as I said, contradict those of terror, rage, overwhelming helplessness. So uh, the example I just gave you was an example of that, of moving with that body memory of my birthday and then being able to, with the help of one of my students, to guide me through and to heal the violence that occurred in my life and, and the danger that our family was in for many years. We could have easily been murdered. Yeah. So how, I think this is kind of a hard question. Now. How do we know, Peter, if we've healed from our past? What are, what are uh, ways that we can see tangibly or feel or, or the ways we think that it's like, okay, I've healed from my, I think we're always still healing to some extent. Um, yeah. but how, how can we, what are some ways like symptoms, if you will, like, how do we know? Mm -hmm. It's something I often, think I, about. That one, yeah, yeah. I think I have an answer to that, that when we feel alive and real, cause aliveness is a sensation in the body tingling, vibration, uh, waves of warmth and so forth. And, you know, sometimes when a, when a client is experiencing something like that, tingling of vibration, I might ask them if they're willing just to say the following sentence and just be curious what happens when they say it, because they're my words, they might not be true for you, but they might mean something else. But if you're willing to say the words, I'm alive, and then I'm alive and I'm real. And usually the the, 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 uh, the strength of those experiences, those tremblings, those vibrations, those movements of energy in the body come into greater awareness. So, uh, so, and we feel real that, you know, because we were at one time real. And if we were fortunate, our parents, our guardians supported that, but in many cases they didn't. And so we didn't feel real. We didn't feel like we were, who we were was being cherished, was being mirrored by the significant other, by the parents or the guardians and so forth. So, and again, to feel alive in a sentient body, in a knowing body, to feel real to our connection with our real self, our true self, true with a capital T, self with a capital S. And I think that's where we're looking for. And again, it's not a, a state that is, you know, you get there and there's nothing else to do. I think we always are challenged to grow further and to help others in their journey along their destiny. I think I'm on the right path then. 
Uh, just from what you described, I think you, so. asked, you asked a question. You asked a question. Um, yeah, I'm alive and I'm real. Um, I'll, I'll try that one later on. Yeah. Yep. Um, on the flip side of that, uh, when somebody doesn't know that maybe they have not been healed or have not healed certain areas of their lives, um, I saw a piece of content on your Insta page and you were talking about how emotions can appear within the body or how unresolved emotional issues can become trapped inside of us. And I'm curious if you can yes. maybe elaborate or shed some wisdom on what that looks like when unresolved issues are trapped inside yeah. of us. Yeah. You know, many of us, most of us, uh, have unresolved issues of unresolved grief. And uh, as a society, we do not do well with grief. We try to push it away. We ignore it. We try to be, we be positive. I call it uh, corrosive positivity. And it's very common, you see, and, and, and most of us uh, are, are afraid of grief. And so we block it and we kind of put it in the recess. But grief is powerful and because grief wants to take us to joy. So when grief pushes up, we try to push down against the grief. And so then the grief pushes up even more and we push down even more. And then it pushes and it seems like if it ever erupts, that will be will be destroyed. But the reason we feel that it will such a negative power is that because the more we we push it away, the more it um, pushes back up for expression. So uh, so I think that's an example of one of the emotions that is most ignored. But we we ignore it. We deny it at our own peril, because if we won't accept grief, then it will hinder our capacity for love, for joy, for joy and for love. So I think that's that's one example. But or and you don't want the person to plunge into the grief. So they're overwhelmed. So again, in, in somatic experiencing, I have a concept I call titration. So we just touch into the trauma or the grief or whatever it is, just touch into it, feel it as sensation, as feeling, maybe even with the images. Sometimes the images are things that may have happened to us in the past, or they're images that they're healing images, what Jung called uh, archetypal images. So, uh, but again, the more we try to push it away, the more we try to deny it, the more it pushes away and it re re wrecks havoc on our body and on our soul. You know, it's the same, similar with shame. Many, many of us have ir issues about shame and it's not the shame that we did something wrong and then we need to apologize to somebody, but something that's become chronic, like um, chronic shame and humiliation, the way um, our parents may have, well, even the fact that we didn't get what we need as infants, we tend to somehow, because we need love, we need love, we can't survive without love. So we then uh, tell ourselves that we are being loved, even when we're being not being loved, even being abused. So again, if we can move through these uh, sensations and feelings, we then come into a deeper connection with ourselves. And, and what we were talking about just before, um, that, you know, that, um, that it comes, am I enough? Yeah, because when we open to grief and joy and care and love, um, we are enough. I mean, it, the sentence doesn't even mean anything anymore. We just are. We just are. Peter, so I, I think I plunged in during my self-acceptance journey because for, for reference, when you, we were talking about how emotions get stored up in the body, like my journey was one of self-acceptance. Like I really struggled with my relationship with my sexuality. And so mm -hmm. again, you had mentioned like shame, uh, guilt, embarrassment, yeah. 
anger. Yep. Like there was so much bottled up and it was the first time, like I said it once over text and then during, the, during my first therapy session, when I was just explaining why I was in therapy, there was just such a rush, like, and, and it felt like a weight lifted off my shoulders, but it was like the most painful mm -hmm. thing I've ever had to do. Um, yeah, but yeah. with that, there was such a weight lifted off my shoulders. Like I felt so yes, much lighter yeah. immediately. I didn't really feel like there wasn't, I wasn't at the point where it went from pain to joy, but it just went from pain to like, to a sense of like relief. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 No, absolute. You know, um, shame kills, strangulates our eros, our sexuality. Actually, that's one of the things I talk about deeply and, and probably the hardest chapter to write in the whole book is about uh, my sexuality. It's, I think the chapter is called Sexuality Delayed. And, uh, and you know, uh, uh, one of my friends who looked it over and said, you can't publish that. It's too, it's too naked. It's too vulnerable. And somebody I respected and I, uh, I, I, I didn't really know which way to turn, but then when the publisher asked a number of people to, um, to, uh, give, uh, endorsements for the book, uh, two of the endorsed two, no, at least two of the endorsements said that the, the chapters that they found the most helpful were the ones on shame and sexuality. So, um, so it is a delicate one. And it's, you know, I have to say that I've been blessed by being with some of the most wonderful women lovers and that have helped me move into my natural energetic state into eros, into connection. So, and this is, again, this is something that has gone on and, 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 um, and their, their, their ability to, or their willingness to be with me in my awkward places has also helped in my, uh, in, in healing my, um, sexual wounds. And they are, and again, in our society, uh, we so often, you know, I mean, look, you talk about about boys and how they their sex education. You know what that is, right? Mm -hmm. Pornography. You know, women to uh, to their relationship to their bodies, young women, mm -hmm. they go on the Internet and they see pictures of people who are anorectic. And those are the people they say, OK, this is how I want to look my God, this is just crazy. It's just crazy. And, you know, and as a society, we need to do better. We need to guide our, our adolescents. Actually, uh, I'm in the, I have two more books after this one that I want to, that I want to write. Well, actually one I've begun and it's on, on trauma and spirituality. The other is in healthy sex, sex for, um, adolescents. And, um, and we are a life negative society, a, a, a Eros negative society. So it takes again, courage and support to own those disowned parts of ourselves. So, um, I heard this, I was listening to a podcast and you'll be able to explain this probably better than I can, but I want to give the overview so you can put it in terms that make sense. But the, the gist of it was that and it really resonated for me is that when we have like unhealed wounds and we're living in this state of and we have trauma that we haven't processed and emotions that we haven't processed um ourselves like biologically are in a state of like survival more or less and when we're yeah, yeah. able to heal through our wounds these cells become more balanced and are giving off love and more high vibrational frequency and it was really, and I'm yeah. sure I'm not explaining that perfectly accurate, but that's kind of the gist of it. And it was really resonant for me because all else equal, sleep equal, like still working out the same I did beforehand, all things else equal, I have unlocked so much more energy or I feel so much more energetic um, post like self mm, uh, healing yeah. journey, self acceptance, self love. Mm. And so when, when they, right. they explained it biologically, it was like, wow, that, that makes so much sense. But I would love for you to just kind of touch on that. 
Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's wonderful. And then to be able to share that with another, to be able to find our own self connection, and then to share that with somebody else who has also uh, been voyages on their journey and to come together. I think that's the greatest gift that we can give not only to ourselves, to, but to others and to each others. So to share that aliveness, that vitality, that, you know, joy de vivre, that joy of life. Um, I think that's the greatest, greatest gift, uh, gift to be human is to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, now, it's a good pivot. I, and, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say, I'm going to have to get off in a bit. Um, so if there's a, one other thing maybe that you want me to sure. address. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to stick with that connection piece because another piece of your content talked about how humans were invoking our instinct to connect during a time of COVID. And I think you brought up the example of yeah. The guy oh, yeah. with a guitar in Italy on his balcony. I love this one because I'm Italian mm -hmm. and my yeah. mom sent it to me. He's playing a guitar and then like somebody else comes out on their balcony and starts playing their instrument and like this sense yeah, of community. Banging, banging pots and pans. Yeah, and yeah. this like sense of community builds. And I'm just wondering like, assuming you've lived here in Western culture for most of your life, as, as you've seen more like individualistic type tendencies in our society, like can you just shed your take on the importance of building community and connections and social connection um, and the importance yeah. of it, of us yeah. to build that here? Hmm. Yeah, to build community. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think you pretty well said it. You know, it takes, there's an, uh, uh, a Motown song goes like, it takes one to stand in the dark alone. It takes two to let the light shine through. And it takes the community to really let the light come through. You know, and uh, I, I think of how important you know, it is for children, for babies and children and, and toddlers and children to have this connection of a community. Uh, I have these, these friends, uh, wonderful. I, I just adore them. And, um, uh, long story, how they worked together as a couple, then she met somebody else and then got together with him, but they stayed together. And then also, uh, his, and, and the original person was also like the uncle. And then the mother came from somewhere in the Midwest to live with them. So this, this baby is absolutely bathed in people, a community that love him. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, uh, my friend Gabor Mate. That's your, oh, your friend you know, with also. Gabor Mate. Wow. That's. Uh... Yeah, yeah. No, no, we're good friends. Um, he wrote a book called. What the heck was the book called? Um, I just bought the most recent one. I forgot what it was called. Healing in a, in a Toxic Culture, something you know, like that. Uh, basically, it's when healing when the, the, the society is sick. Um, I, can't, I can't think of it right now. Uh, but anyhow, it really is, you know, we have to find that healing in ourselves because we don't really get that modeled in our society. And that's too bad because, you know, uh, we're to say that we're not affected by the society is, is a, an illusion because we are. And but we want to also maybe contribute to our society and to, um, to finding a way to, to have a healthy relationships and to share those healthy relationships. And I think that's really, that's really where it's at. Yeah. I mean, that's where I've gotten the most fulfillment and, and joy is through this through social connection, deep connection, like actual connection, not surface level. Yeah. Um, with that, we're, we're going to wrap up Peter, uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing a little bit of your story as well as talking about your new book and, and just sharing so much wisdom with us. Again, Peter's coming out with a new book called, an, or it's already on Amazon. It sounds like an autobiography of trauma. We'll drop the That's link right. to it everywhere. Um, Thanks. Go buy it. I'll be, I'll be a, a purchaser and a reader as well. It. 
Um, and, but thank you so much, Peter. Okay. And I just want to mention one other thing that we're having a, 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 a program. It's the end of February, the, begin, the very beginning of March called Immersion. And it's rather a different thing that's put together by my institute and by Scott Lyons uh, and Body Lab, where people can go and they also can have healing sessions as part of the immersion. Well, that is the immersion, I guess. And it's, uh, it's going to be in, in San Diego. And I think it's also streamed. But if you go to somaticexperiencing.com, I think the connection is there. Anyhow, it was good to meet you, uh, Matt. And, uh, and Walk in Beauty. Stand Thank tall you. and walk in beauty. Thank you very much. San Diego okay. sounds like a great place to heal. All right. A good place to be. Yep. Thanks again.